At Family Church, we celebrate the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus uh, all the time. But once a month, we, we celebrate using the Lord's Supper and communion. And if you're watching us regularly online, I think it'd be a great idea if you would have a cracker and juice or if you'd have some way that you can celebrate with us so that in the service time when we actually have communion, you can share that with us wherever you are. I hope you can do that today. And we are in a series called Exponential. And in case you flunked math... That means like rapidly multiplying. And we're looking at the first section of the book of Acts, and we called it momentum, how God was building this learning to take steps. And then exponential, we're really focusing on how God uses us to help other people take steps. And so it's the rapid growth of the church. And we looked last week at how there was a blind man who needed to see spiritually, and his name was Saul. And God opened his eyes spiritually. This week, we're looking at another apostle named Peter. And God's got to open his eyes as well. So I have a question for you as we start off with. How would you know if you don't see the same thing everybody else sees? How do you know if you're blind? Let me give you a test. What do you see here? Some of you see 29. Some of you might see 70. If you're what they call red-green colorblind... And some of you might just see a bunch of blobby circles because you're more profoundly colorblind. So let's try this again. What do you see here? Some people see 74. Anybody see 21? Congratulations, you're red-green colorblind. And if you don't see anything, you're monochromatic. <laughs> you're completely colorblind. But here's the real question. If you're growing up as a kid, how would you ever find that out? Well, we have some people who are colorblind on staff, and they said it was light bright. That little toy where you have to try to plug in the right lights, they couldn't do it right. And then you can never tell what color the Skittles are going to taste like. <laughs> I mean, it's the important parts of your life, right? But, it, but if you grow up and somebody says, this is a red apple, and this is what you see, how do you know that you're not seeing the same thing they're seeing? The only way you find out is somebody reveals it to you. Spiritual analogy. How do we find out if we are spiritually blind? Because Saul was so sure he was right. He was willing to kill people because of what he believed to be the truth. How did God have to rearrange his whole thinking so that he would see that he was blind? And this week we're looking at somebody who's not quite as profoundly blind. He's only red-green color blind. He gets some of the picture, but not all of it. And I believe that all of us are visually challenged. Now, some of you are nearsighted. Some of you are farsighted. If you actually are blessed with 20-20 vision, you should just get down on your knees and thank God right now. Because it's an amazing gift. But we easily don't know how we're blind until you come through a test or something that helps you see. And we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, turn there, and we're going to see God putting Peter through a test that reveals his colorblindness. In fact, it reveals his bias against certain people that God wants to love into the kingdom, that God wants to include. And so we, we start this story with a guy named Cornelius, and I'm going to call him the hungry heart. Here's a guy who wants to know about God, and God wants to use Peter to help tell him about Jesus, but Peter has a problem. So let's back up and get this story. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. Now pause right there for a minute. If you were a Jewish person living in Palestine at the time, and I told you this man is a centurion of the Roman army, and in addition to that, he's from the motherland. He's from Rome, from Ita Italy. What your picture would be of such a person? You'd think of him as a killer, an oppressor, somebody who was filled with power and might and not much compassion, the kind of person who crucified people. So that was their perception of a Roman centurion. Look at what it says in the next verse about this guy. It says, he and all his family were devout deeply dedicated to their spiritual life, deeply wanting to get spiritual velocity. 
They were God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need, and he prayed to God regularly. That'd be awesome to put on your tombstone, wouldn't it? In other words, God picked like the pick of the litter Gentile because this man was not a Jewish convert. He was a God-fearer which means that he was a Gentile who believed in the one true God and he acknowledged him, but he didn't go the whole way to get circumcised and to follow all the rules of the Jewish people. He, he was a God-fearer. So I believe he may have been the most righteous Gentile in all of Israel at this time. And God picks him because he has a big plan that he wants to do something. But this guy has this incredible lifestyle He's got a a desire to love God and to follow him, and he's generous and he's prayerful, but he has an information gap. We find out a little later that he probably knows something about Jesus, but he doesn't know the whole story about Jesus. And so here's like the perfect candidate, and I call him a hungry heart because he's somebody who God wants to reach out to, who he's already working in, and it's somebody that God is already beginning to develop in him that desire to know God, to know him better. And here's what happens. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. And Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. Now I have a little pet peeves that sometimes in art, angels are presented as like they're afraid to get their robes wet and they're kind of these little wimpy sort of things. And and you look at this, uh, we have a Bible book that, we're reading for Sawyer, and when the angels show up, they're like burly and huge, and, and I think, that's how angels ought to look, because every time they show up, what do they have to say? <laughs> don't freak out. Don't run away. It's okay. I'm one of the good guys, and so he says, it says, Cornelius stared at him in fear. Can you imagine if you were just praying, and all of a sudden, an angel appeared to you? Would that kind of rearrange your theology? Yeah, yeah it would be scary. And the angel said, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. God is paying attention. God has heard you. And then he says, here's your plan. Send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who's called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. I'd point out again that God is not efficient, but he's effective. I was thinking as I read this through again, here it is again. The angel shows up. Why doesn't he just tell him about Jesus? I mean, that'd be so much faster, right? But God is like a master chess player. If you're playing somebody that's good at chess, they're two or three moves ahead of you. If you're playing a master chess player, they're like seven or eight moves ahead of you. And I think you have to see that God always has a bigger plan than you understand. It's one of the important things to understand from Scripture is that we get so focused on what is my feeling and my circumstance and what I want and what I get to do. And if you begin to believe that God has a much bigger plan called the kingdom of God, and he's doing something that's so incredible and so wonderful, but to us, quite often, we don't get it. We don't know why this happened or why that happened. And so God is moving in Cornelius' life And he says, I I have a plan for you. Here's the plan. Send down to the city down below you a little fishing village called Joppa and find this guy named Simon who's living with Simon and go find him. Because God is working not just to include the centurion, not just to include Cornelius. He's working to change the mindset of Peter and of all of the apostles, all of the Jewish people, so that they get to see God's bigger plan. So I want to ask you just a question for a moment. Who is it that you think in your life God is working in that has a hungry heart? I'll tell you that God has created all of us to have a God-sized hole in us, and until we begin to really understand who he is and what his purpose for us is, we will keep trying to put happiness or money or success or business or all kinds of other things we try to put there and they will never adequately fill it up. But God has people in your school, in your place of business, in your neighborhood, who are not only in need of God, God is already starting to stir in them, and he's working. You see, we're always afraid to share our story or to tell people about Jesus unless you believe 
that God is already at work in some people. And see, God was totally preparing the ground here for Peter. He had, he had Cornelius all teed up and ready to go, didn't he? And so what does God say to, to Cornelius? Send your people down to get Peter. And so he sent a couple of servants, and he sent his soldier. And then he said, okay, God, I will do what you've called me to do, even though I don't understand what it is. And then we have the next player in this cool story. And his name is Peter. He is one of the key apostles. He's the one that said, Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so it picks up his story here in verse 9. It says, about noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, that is the, the servants who came from Cornelius, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and he wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. And it contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And a voice spoke to him a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. I don't know if you've ever had weird dreams, but Peter was thinking this was a weird dream, right? And then it happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. God begins to work on Peter's blindness, and I think if we, it's, it helps us if we know, where did that blindness come from? Because Peter was of the Jewish faith, and they had been God's chosen people for hundreds of years. And their picture of that was somewhat accurate, and some of it was distorted. They weren't completely blind, they were just colorblind. And the way that they saw it is that they thought that God had a plan for them more than he had planned for the rest of the world. So here, here's what the geography is. This is Caesarea, which is where Cornelius lives. It is a big, huge uh, city that, that uh, was built by the, the king who was Herod the Great, we call him. And he went in and took this nothing fishing village and he made this huge regular harbor. It was a man-made harbor because before that, Joppa was the only natural harbor that Israel had. And so he made this huge city. He made a beautiful palace. He actually dug a swimming pool in the, in the stone right by the sea. I mean, it was a fabulous. The, the ruins of it today are still incredible. And there's a theater there and a hippodrome. And it's, it was the place to be. It had all the arts. It had all of the Greek and Roman gods. It was the, the center of culture in Israel, the center of non-godly culture. And then, of course, Jerusalem was the religious center. And Joppa was just this little fishing village over to the side. And that's where Peter was. And I want you to remember this, because Jen, when we go to Israel, she says Joppa is one of her favorite spots. Because for you and I, if you're not from a Jewish background, this is one of the most important stories in all of the book of Acts. Because remember when we talked about the story of Jonah just a couple of weeks ago? And Jonah was called to go to Gentiles also. He was called to go to the Ninevites, the Assyrians. And instead of that, he went to Joppa and headed for Tarshish, right? So it's the same little village where Jonah jumped off to go the wrong way. And in the same place, God calls Peter and he says, I want you to love the Gentiles like I do. And to him, he didn't have to go to Nineveh. He just had to go up the, the beach to a place called Caesarea. But it was a huge step for him. Because he was blind from some things from the past. that Things that God had told him that they understood somewhat, but they didn't completely understand. You see, God had said to the Jewish people, I want you to be my city set on a hill. I want you to be a light to the nations. And they were supposed to follow God, and God was going to bless them, and because of that, the whole world could see that God was real. But instead of that, they kept falling into idol worship and kept blowing it, and so they were not the light on the hill that they were supposed to be. But you see, they had a very clear picture that God lived in one place. He lived in the temple, and everything unholy had to stay away from him, and everything holy had to be there in that temple. So they were focused on a place, and then they were focused on all of their culture, you see, they, they ate 
clean food, not unclean food. And they had only certain animals that they could eat. And, and they had to follow certain rituals of hand washing and all kinds of things that, that defined them as a culture. And, and that was part of God's old covenant with them. And God says, now there's a new covenant in my son Jesus, and it's going to change more than you thought it was going to change. You see, they were raised seeing this inscription when they went to the temple. This has been uh, found, they found two different copies. There were nine different copies of this inscription, and here's the interpretation. No foreigner may enter within the balustrade or the little wall that's around the temple, around the sanctuary and the enclosure. Whoever is caught on himself shall be put the blame for the death which will ensue. And there was some debate as to whether they killed people or if they just figured they were cursed by God and that would die. But in their understanding of God, there was this, this wall that was around this holy place and Gentiles could never come there. And so they saw themselves not only as being chosen and blessed by God, but they saw themselves as superior to everybody else. And so you see, there was, there was a blindness. In fact, they followed the scriptural requirements, and then just like good religious people everywhere, they added a whole bunch of extra laws. And they said, not only should we not let the Gentiles into the temple, you shouldn't even go and eat with the Gentile. You see, they, they added to it, and because of that, they kept themselves completely separate. And that was their idea of what it meant to be blameless and good. And God says, you know, I chose the Jewish people, and they were there for a very, very critical season, and that's who the Messiah was going to come through. And much of the time Jesus was here on earth, he was preaching only to the Jewish people. But all the way through, you see hints of the Samaritan woman and the Syrophoenician woman and, and God reaching out beyond and Philip goes to Samaria and then the Ethiopian eunuch and, and God begins to expand their picture. But this is the critical moment. Joppa is the place where you and I got included into the family of Christ. And so he says to Peter, here's this sheet that comes down. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's going like, no, that's a temptation. I would never do that. And God says, get ready, Peter. I'm going to change your whole world. I'm opening you up. And then he says this powerful statement, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. You see, if he takes a sinful Jewish person and makes them clean, or if he takes a sinful Gentile person and makes them clean, it's God who makes things clean. It's not buildings or diets or restrictions. And God says this new covenant is going to be with all people. You and I have no idea what a hard pill that was to swallow. They had so much lived in separation. I think there's another kind of blindness that Peter was dealing with. I think that he was afraid that when these people came to his house, and let me read you this next part. It says, while Peter was wandering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. And while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. Get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. And Peter went down and he said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? And so they tell him the story of Cornelius' visit with the angel and about how he's to go with them. You see, I think the second kind of blindness that affects all of us is Peter was afraid of what people would say. You see, if you went up there and commingled with the Gentiles, the, the first part of chapter 11, as soon as he comes home, what do they say to him? You went up there and ate with the Gentiles? Let me tell you, we don't do a lot of things that God calls us to do because we're afraid we're going to get criticized. Let me put your mind at rest. You're going to get criticized no matter what you do. <laughs> Criticism is a fact of life, isn't it? Just be sure you're getting criticized for the right things. Be sure you're getting criticized because you're stepping out in faith and believing what God has called you to do instead of getting criticized for everything else. But I think Peter was afraid of that. And I think there was also another level. I think that you see in Peter even though he had come to faith in Jesus, and even though he knew that Jesus died for the world, Peter still believed that he owned God. 
Sometimes this happens. The longer you've been a follower of Jesus, the easier it is to isolate yourself from people who don't know Jesus. The easier it is to, in some way, subtly begin to feel superior. Like, I've got God, and I own him. And we're so glad that God forgives us, and the grace of God extends to us. We're not that interested in extending it to everybody else. Let me tell you, it happens. And I think that you see in Peter this wrestling match. You see, the the Jewish people were raised to, to call Gentiles dogs. There was not just a, we're God's chosen people. There was also, you're the unchosen people. And so I think it's really hilarious. This is, passage is funny that Cornelius' servants come to Peter and he decides to go with them. God was really clear. Three people are coming. They're going to ask you to go. Go with them. I don't think God's given Peter any wiggle room here. This is time. And so he goes up to the, the journey up to Caesarea. And when he gets there, Cornelius has this whole house full of people. He's re- ready to hear what Peter's going to say. In fact, there's this kind of awkward moment where he bows down and he starts worshiping Peter. And Peter's like, whoa, get up, get up, get up, get up. This is not, I'm not, I'm just a human being. But he has to walk into this room and for a religious Jewish person to walk into this whole room with Gentiles, he's feeling awkward. So what does Peter do with this sensitive, culturally difficult moment? Look what he says. While talking with them, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people, and he said to them, you're well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. Isn't that a great way to start your conversation? You know, I am not supposed to be here with you people. But here's the next part. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean, So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? You see, God is working at developing Peter's heart. And I call this message the reluctant messenger. Because I think there's a lot of ways in which we're not completely blind, but we're partially blind. That we don't believe God could really use us. Maybe we don't believe that Jesus really is the only answer for the needs of the human heart. Maybe we hope God will use somebody else. Maybe we think that's the church's job or the pastor's job. But I want you to play what if for me, with me for a moment. I want you to say, what if I am blind? What if there's some things that I need to see? What if there's some things that God wants to stir in me? And I'll tell you, uh, Jan and I just crossed the line of being here 32 years on the 1st of May. And if you could believe it, when we came, there were 35 people here, and You know, we had one big goal. It was like survive, (laughs) not die. And if you could have told me 30 years in the future, God's going to use this church to change people's lives and to plant campuses in other communities, I frankly would not have had the faith to believe it. But God wants to do more in us and through us than we can believe. And we get quite often stuck with what I can already see what I can already feel, what I feel capable of instead of what I feel God is capable of. So what would it look like if if everybody at Family Church was seeking after God and learning about Jesus and committing their life to him and, and getting baptized and taking all of the spiritual steps that they needed to take to have spiritual velocity? What would happen if you weren't stuck, but you were moving and God was working in you actively and and that was a priority in your life? What would it look like if, if every single one of us saw ourselves as on mission and we are deployed, that when God sends you out of here to get encouraged in the scriptures and get stirred up with our worship together and then you were supposed to go into your school or into your neighborhood or into your place of business, or into your friendship circle, and you were supposed to be the one who was praying for people, and you were supposed to share your story of what God had done in your life, and you were supposed to be the light in that place where you go. See, I think as soon as we say that, all of those objections kick up, like, I don't know enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not, and you know what? The question is not what you can do, the question is what God can do. And that's where we're a little blind. We don't necessarily believe that God can do what God can do. 
What if every single one of us were focusing on helping somebody else take spiritual steps? We were meeting with somebody weekly and pouring into them just what you know, just listening to them, just challenging them, just praying with them. And you say, I don't know enough. And you know what? You'll never know enough. You just do what God has called you to do and you take the next step and God does the rest. But what if that wasn't something that we thought a few superstar Christians did? What if that's something we thought every Christian did? That we didn't think we go to church, we think we are the church. And everywhere we are, we are the church. And God uses our contacts, whether it's coaching Little League soccer or helping out with a neighbor who needs help with the mowing of the lawn or something. What if everything was in the context of God wants to use us to let people see him. You know, what if we looked at not how much we know in our head, but how much we live in our lives? What if it was not about information? What if it was about transformation? What if the Bible test was not how many books of the Bible there are, but what's the name of your neighbors? And God's called us to be hospitable and to connect with people and to let them know that we love him so that we can let him know that he loves him. What if that was really how we lived? What if all of those things became normal? Do you think God would make a difference? You see, we've been challenged as a church staff to instead of thinking of addition, where we have a church, a, a large number, and then a few get more, get added every month or every year. What if it was exponential where every individual was leading somebody to faith this year. And every individual was helping them grow in their spiritual journey. And that you were not only taking steps, you were helping other people take steps. I tell you, Douglas County would not be the same. And I believe that God wants to do great things like that. So what happens in this story? There's this huge breakthrough moment where Peter goes in and he tells him, I'm here because God made me come. <laughs> and, then you, and then you have the revelation. He begins to tell them about who he is and what God's doing in his life. And then he begins to tell them about Jesus. Look what he says. Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. See, that's the name of his blindness. Is God loves everybody, but I'm his favorite. It's about me and not about God. And then he says, but he accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of what? Oh. You see, Peter is being honest, and he's getting it himself. I see that God is different than I thought. His plan is different than I thought. He loves the Gentiles the same way he loves the Jewish people. And Peter, in humility, is acknowledging his own blindness, and he's now ready to tell them about Jesus. And he goes on for about seven or eight verses, pretty briefly. He tells them that Jesus came to earth and that he was called by the Spirit of God and that he healed and that he taught and that he was crucified and that he died for three days and that he was raised to life. And Peter goes on to say, and I was chosen to be a witness of his resurrection. I'm here to tell you what Jesus has done and what he's doing in me. You see, everybody can tell their story. And he says, I want you to know, this is what God wants you to know. This is the gap that you've had. You've had a hungry heart for God. Here's the answer. It's Jesus. The answer is always Jesus, isn't it? And as we get to know him, the more you see him changing your life, the more you want to include other people into that change. And then there's the evidence that comes because God not only is working through Peter, God kind of pushes him out of the road and steps up. I think it's hilarious that God interrupts him before he's done with his sermon. Now, I'm not saying preachers get long-winded or anything like that. But God is ready to move when Peter's still talking. And it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. And the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they had heard him speaking in tongues and praising God. 
couple of, couple of observations here. No matter how we, God uses us in the process, it's God that brings people to himself. You know what? You can never talk somebody into being a believer. It's only God that gives the gift of faith. It's only God that draws people to himself. But he wants us to participate. He wants us to have that privilege. And I wish for every one of you that this year you would have a chance to pray with somebody who's giving their life to Christ for the first time. Let me tell you, it's awesome. And too often we think of as a church as how much we go and how much we serve and how much we learn instead of how much God uses us to see the changing of lives. So first of all, God is the one that does. This kind of almost interrupts Peter. And then I want you to see it says the gift of the Spirit fell on them. And that I particularly think that in this chapter of the book of Acts, the speaking of tongues is really important because he's saying to them, it's the same Spirit in the same way as happened in the book of Acts chapter 2, which was when the, Gent or the Jewish people received the Holy Spirit in the same kind of way. I don't think we have any idea how easily it could have been a Gentile church and a Jewish church. And God said, no, I want this to be one. In fact, in Ephesians, it says that the death of Jesus broke down the dividing wall of hostility. And I think it must refer to that wall in the temple that said Gentiles can't go any further. In fact, if you read the book of, the, the book of Ephesians, he says, we who were outside of the covenants. We didn't have the words of God. We didn't have the promises. We were outsiders. We have been included in. Our Jewish guide in Israel this year said, yeah, you guys have been grafted in, but we are part of the roots. <laughs> and the Bible says that we were grafted in, that we are included as the undeserving who were given grace. And so Peter says, okay, I get it. And then I want you to see that this, this problem they're having seeing, the other believers from Joppa that came with him, they're like, the Spirit is poured out even on the Gentiles? And sure enough, as soon as Peter goes home, he gets in trouble. Because God did this to Gentiles. And we can look at them and we can say, wow, how could they be so blind? But I believe that you and I have the same kinds of blindness. I believe there are people in your world right now that God wants to reach, that have hungry hearts, that are needing Christ, and you don't see them because you see something else. Maybe you've got them in a box where God could never save them. Do any of you have that God could never save these people list? Yeah, some of you used to be on that list, you know? <laughs> or maybe somebody that's offended you, or maybe somebody that's different than you. And so I want you to ask you that first question is, who is it that God wants you to see? If you would entertain with me the potential that maybe you have some blind spots, that God is wanting to work in you to open up your eyes to some people around you, that God is wanting you to believe that he can use even you as you are. You say, well, I don't really know enough yet. Do you know who Jesus is and do you know what he can do in people's lives? That's all you need to start with. And the second thing is I would love you to take action, to say, what can I do to reach out to somebody? God calls us to be hospitable and to love people and to be his light in the place where he put you. And as you do that, some people will reject you and some people will draw to the light. And God's assignment for you is to tell them the truth about Jesus so that they can come to the light as well. And you know, I know we know this, but it's so easy not to live it, isn't it? Our blindness is that we agree, but we don't obey. And I tell you, God is inviting us into the greatest adventure ever. We're going to take a moment and pray, and then we're going to sing a song called Open the Eyes of My Heart. And I want it to be a reflection, not only as we move towards communion, but I want you to wrestle with that. God, am I colorblind? Am I missing some things you want me to see? And if God puts somebody in your heart, especially as we're praying, take that as a direct word. This is the person you're supposed to pray for. This is the person you're supposed to reach out to. God, thank you for these powerful scriptures that talk about how easy it is for us to be religious instead of really being directed by you and how easy it is to see partially but not completely and how easy it is, God, to be hesitant to do what you've called us to do. 
And I ask that you would give us your insight and your wisdom and your words. And that right now, as we ask you and invite you to open the eyes of our heart, that you would help us to see you differently, that you'd help us to see ourselves differently, that you'd help us to see other people differently. And God, I know that Douglas County is full of people who are broken and lost and hurting. Some of them are up and outers and some of them are down and outers. But if they don't have a relationship with you, they're outers. And God, you've called us not to be a, a holy community that pulls away from everybody around us. You've called us to be invested and deployed into our culture so that we can be the people you use to be lights in the darkness. And God, this is something that's over our head. We're inadequate for it. But we know that you are completely adequate. And I ask that even now as we sing, as we pray, that you'd put people on our hearts, people who are believers that need to be encouraged and discipled, people that are not yet followers of Jesus, that, that need that information about Jesus. And God, we trust you to work in the ways that we can't. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you're watching online, either because you're sick and can't make it or out of town, or maybe you watch online regularly, let me invite you to, while we are celebrating communion here at Family Church, to take, and take a few moments and celebrate communion right there in your own home, if you're able, or wherever you might be. And I'm going to walk through a little bit of a teaching on it and just kind of help us understand it. But if you have a possibility of going and getting a cup, um, picking up some crackers, a uh, loaf of bread, something that you can take and physically participate in this as we go through the process, it will be meaningful to you. And how you get the elements and what you put them in and if it's grape juice or wine or whatever you want to take, it's, those, those details really are not the point of it. The point of it is this is a spiritual exercise of, of examining ourselves, of reviewing what the truth is, and, the, and, and it's a spiritual moment that the Scripture speaks of very highly. And so I'd like to lead you through that um, wherever you are right now. And if you have somebody or if you're able to, to go ahead and grab some crackers and grab some juice, then when we get to the end of this, we'll have an opportunity for you just to take a few moments as we are here at Family Church and celebrate what Jesus has done for us. So I'd, I'd like to read, first of all, from 1 Corinthians 11. And Paul is writing to a church that's actually doing it all wrong, and he's kind of trying to correct them, and so he brings in some things to, to bring this back to a point of worship. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. So Paul wasn't there. He didn't come to be a follower of Jesus till after that. And so evidently Jesus had communicated to him that this is how he was supposed to, to remember that what had happened. And so he, Paul, like us, wasn't there in person. So this is his way of reviewing and remembering that. And so it says, Jesus broke the bread and then he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. To proclaim is to, to share something as true and to, to, again, review it and remember that. And so he's saying, whenever you go through this exercise, you are reminding yourself, you are saying, Wow, this is what happened, and and Jesus' body was broken for me, and, and his blood was shed for me, and I am now a part of the family of, of God. I am now forgiven. I am now included because of what Jesus has done. And then he goes on and gives a little warning. He said, So then, whoever eats the body or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. So everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. And, he, and he's dealing with a situation where they actually had a whole love fest, a, a big feast, and, and some people were coming, and they were hungry, and they were elbowing their way in, and they were getting a lot, and it, it turned into a, a, a kind of a wild party. And he was saying, man, that is dangerous. You've forgotten what this is about. But, but it's also a great reminder for you and I. 
that before we take this moment and remember Jesus in this special way, he says we're supposed to examine ourselves. What, what is my relationship with Christ like? Is there any sin? And I, and I think it's often appropriate just to stop and to pray and to say, God, is there anything in my life that's hindering you working? Is there, is there anybody I've offended? Is there anything that I, maybe it's a sin you clearly know that you committed and you just need to confess it. And, and maybe you think, I, I don't really think of anything that I've done specifically that was an act of sin. But you allow the Holy Spirit to point out where you've been selfish or where you've been misusing the, the resources God's given you or something that the Spirit points out. And that's, that's part of the function of not only examining yourself, as it says, but, but doing that and letting God examine you. And so there's that moment of, of kind of humility and of, of prayer and of asking God to show you and, and offering up and saying, God, thank you that your, your blood is sufficient to cover that sin too. I, I confess, I, I blow it all the time. I'm, I'm a sinful person. And thank you, God, for forgiving me. And and, and you go through a period of time and examine and, and confess and, and kind of like clear the plate. And I, I think it's impor- important for us to do that daily, but it seems like when we celebrate communion, there's kind of a, a big moment where you're saying, okay, I want to clear my heart. And then, and then he says we are to remember the body and blood of Christ. And I, and I think as you go through and as you take that bread, you, you think about cross and you think about Jesus saying, not my will, but yours be done. And and about his body that was, he was whipped and his the crown of thorns. And, and not to become gruesome or to focus on the gory part of it, but, but to realize that it, the cost that it was for him. This, this is a free gift for me, but wow, the cost was incredible. And, and, and when you think of the blood and the fact that it was shed for me, that that's the only way that sin is forgiven. In, in the Old Testament, it was a lamb that was killed in the... The throat was slit and the blood was put on the altar. And that was a picture of the cost of sin. And so as you remember those things, you, you come to that moment of not only soberness, but it's, it's, we call it a celebration because you're thinking, wow, this is so incredible. And so you, you take that and, and then I encourage you and, I, and I'd like to just pray with you. And then when we're done praying, whenever you're ready, you, you take that bread and you take that cup and you say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I... I remember you, I take this. And you, you eat the bread and drink, the, drink from the cup and, and let it be a, a spiritual moment for you. So I'd like to lead you in prayer. And um, if, if you'd like to spend a few moments after that uh, examining your heart and seeing if God would show you anything that you need to confess and then, and then go ahead and eat and, and drink whenever you're ready. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for those who are joining us online. And and Father, all of us have things in our life where selfishness comes in and where bitterness comes and where, where we allow fear to control us instead of you. And I ask that you would just lead us, God, to confess whatever it is that might hinder our relationship or you working in us. And then I ask that as we eat this piece of bread, a cracker, as we drink this juice or this wine, that, that we would do it as an act of worship, remembering and reminding ourselves how valuable and how important this is and and saying how grateful we are to you. So God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for giving us this this symbol to remind us because we are a forgetful people. In your precious name, amen. Now as the music continues, just go through that process wherever you are in that and we'll trust that this will be a special part of your worship today. Thank you.